I think the, having a, a, a richer and better, bigger uh, ecology of public financial institutions is crucial for a number of reasons. Number one, they will provide the things that we need rather than the things that the bankers need. But number two, the bankers have a big club that they hold over the heads of the rest of us. The club is, well, if, if you don't give us what we want, we're going to have a, a capital strike. We're not going to finance you, or we're going to move our headquarters or abroad, or we're going to do something else. If we have a really rich uh, group of public financial institutions, um, it'll be easier for us as a society to say, OK, good riddance, goodbye, you can move. We don't need you. So these public financial institutions also serve as um, a safety net for, for the rest of us. My name is Gerald Epstein. I'm a professor of economics and co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And my new book, Busting the Bankers Club, Finance for the Rest of Us, published by University of California Press, was originally funded by INET. So it's great to be here with you all. We know the main requirements for a socially productive financial system. It's a regulation of, of all financial institutions. It's uh, leverage requirements and um, uh, policies to ensure that banks finance productive activities. Uh, but we don't have, one, have them because of what I call the Bankers Club. The Bankers Club is a group of allies of, of, of the banks. It's the banks themselves and a group of allies that support them and protect them. And the Bankers Club uh, comes to their defense whenever society or the government tries to uh, hi highly regulate finance um, and make them more socially useful. So the Bankers Club uh, sustains the power of finance through a variety of mechanisms. One is uh, by passing legislation that protects the bankers. Um, this is legislation that deregulates finance, such as the ending of the Glass-Steagall Act in 1998. The Glass-Steagall Act, as you might remember, uh, was the uh, law passed during the Great Depression by FDR and the, and the New Dealers that would separate uh, commercial from investment banks and limit speculation that banks could, could take, uh, put in Federal Deposit Insurance Corp uh, uh, insurance. And um, this legislation, the banks didn't like. The banks didn't like it because it limited what they could do. It reduced the incomes that they could get. And so almost immediately after the Second World War, they started trying to get rid of this legislation and related types of legislation. So they spent uh, millions of dollars, perhaps billions of dollars, in, in financing politicians uh, that would help get rid of this legislation, financing judges that would help get rid of this uh, legislation, uh, financial regulators and lawyers who would try to get rid of it. And so finally, uh, in the late 1990s, they really succeeded um, after hav having nipped away at it um, over the preceding decade. Uh, and under President Clinton, with Alan Greenspan as head of the Federal Reserve, and uh, other neoliberal um, you know, uh, politicians, they finally passed legislation to almost completely deregulate the financial system. And so those are all various ways in which uh, the, the Bankers Club, that is, the Federal Reserve, lawyers, economists I'll talk about a little bit later were also involved, um, and uh, regulators all try to uh, make it easier for the bankers to make money and uh, to get more bigger and more powerful. The Bankers Club uh, is comprised of, of a number of primary groups. First of all, it's the bankers themselves and the politicians, the legislators, uh, that they uh, pay off. They lobby them, they give them um, money to uh, uh, help them have a happy post-legislative uh, life, uh, we call it the revolving door, and, and, and it gives them good jobs once they're done with being legislators. Um, it involves uh, the Federal Reserve. I call the Federal Reserve the chair, the chairman of the club. The Federal Reserve really protects the banks. It orchestrates um, subsidies for the banks, low interest rates when that will help the banks, high interest rates when there's inflation, and that will help the banks. Um, and uh, the Federal Reserve is really their uh, main protector, both at the regulatory level, uh, making sure that they have regulations uh, that aren't uh, too onerous, um, and at the monetary policy level, make sh making sure that monetary policy uh, built, uh, increases asset prices when that's, um, when it, when that's useful and uh, stops inflation when that's useful. Um, in addition to uh, the Federal Reserve, we also have 
uh, the lawyers who work for banks, lawyers who help f fashion legislation that will make it easier for, for banks to expand into new types of businesses, uh, will help the banks get first, um, first in the line when there's a bankruptcy, they get their money back first. Uh, and lawyers, of course, help craft legislation. Uh, and unfortunately, my own profession, the economists, some of them are also in the bankers club as well. Uh, this ha operates at a number of different levels. At one kind of general intellectual level, they develop research that tries to show that um, unregulated financial markets are best for society as a whole. Um, they try to uh, fashion um, fi uh, research that shows that banks should be left to do what they want to do, and that's going to trickle down uh, to the rest of us. So we, I'm thinking of people like Eugene Fama, who got the Nobel Prize for his work on efficient markets and so forth. Of course, what INET is doing is trying to counter um, this kind of research, this kind of ideology, and I think it's been very effective uh, at doing that. Economists also operate in a, in a more material, a more devious way. Uh, some research that I and my former uh, graduate student Jessica Carrick Hagenbarth looked at. We looked at um, economists and top economists who uh, were kind of on the take from the bankers. That is, they were on the boards of directors of bankers. They uh, got consulting fees from, for bankers. And then when they appeared in, in public and, and supported uh, banks and, lo and low regulation, they didn't reveal the fact that they were also uh, getting money from the banks themselves. Uh, the, another group that uh, I, th I think is very important to look at is non-financial corporations. Uh, as, um, as Tom Ferguson has written in his really important work on the Depression, during the Depression there was a group of, of um, banks that really, uh, the, excuse me, non-financial corporations that really didn't align themselves uh, with uh, the Bankers Club. They, they supported uh, the New Deal res uh, uh, regulations by uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, so there was kind of a split at that time between some segments of finance and some segments of industry. But by the time we get to the 1990s and the 2000s, uh, you can find almost no space between finance and industry. And the uh, question is why? And I looked into that quite a lot. And one possibility is the idea of financialization, that non-financial corporations get more and more of their income uh, from financial activities. And that's, that's important, but I think the main reason is what I call the financialization of the CEOs. That is, the CEOs and top management of these corporations um, are fabulously wealthy, and they need financiers to manage their funds and to get them the tax breaks and to help them get around um, uh, tax laws and so forth. And so they don't want to interfere with the, what finance can do because they personally gain so much from what the financial industry does. So th that's why they align themselves uh, as part of the Bankers Club with finance. I begin the book talking about the Jekyll and Hyde of, of, the, of finance. And the, you'll probably recall the Robert Louis Stevenson story. Uh, Dr. Jekyll, an upstanding member of the uh, community, had this other side, the Dr. Hyde side, who was a murderous uh, villain. And um, they were both embedded in the same person. And the financial system is kind of like that. That is, we as a society need finance. We need finance to support mortgages for homes, for investing uh, in plant and equipment, for coming up with innovations that will help everybody to invest in communities, small businesses, et cetera. At times, financial system becomes what I call roaring banking. That is. It uh, creates financial crises every 10 or 12 years, needs to get bailed out. Um, it allocates most of its resources to speculation, um, to having uh, a lot of leverage in the economy and, and, and creating crises. And it doesn't provide good services for most of the population. That is, small businesses are often rationed out or charged too much. Uh, for retirement, it doesn't um, offer good financial retirement for most uh, people. Um, so that's the, the Hyde part of finance. Now, why is this? It's because uh, finance essentially can create money out of thin air. And it can create money out of thin air and make enormous profits um, by engaging in uh, all of these kinds of speculative 
activities. So unless the government regulates finance, uh, makes it difficult or impossible for it to engage in these kinds of activities, um, it's going to make the most profit for the companies and for the CEOs by engaging in this kind of speculative and destructive activity. So when we have proper guardrails, when we have proper regulation, and um, we also have to have uh, the government that's underwriting the, the, be the, hides the Jekyll side of finance, underwriting the good things, then we can have uh, a, a financial system that operates for the rest of us. There's so much artificially created uh, uh, complexity and obscurity of, uh, of, around finance because as Dennis uh, Kelleher, the head of Better Markets, puts it, finance does very well in the dark. That is, when uh, there's a lot of uh, complexity, first of all, uh, the people on the other side of the trade, that is the people who are buying the financial products or are borrowing from the financial companies, they don't really understand uh, completely uh, what's involved um, with, with these investments, what the real costs are, and so forth. Um, and that allows financial markets to create products that are sold um, not like commodities, where there's clear understanding of what's in it, and there's a common competitive price, um, but they're able to charge uh, high prices for their, uh, for their commodities. Um, and get an extra profit from it, number one. Number two, uh, this complexity makes it hard for, for uh, an obscurity makes it hard for these uh, products to be regulated. So the regulators have trouble understanding what's in them, um, and so they can't regulate. And the financiers themselves use this as an excuse for saying, well, we're the only ones who really understand it. Let us regulate ourselves. You don't try to regulate it. Moreover, if uh, people, um, out in the community, they can't understand us, uh, so they can't really try to rein us in and prevent us from doing this. Um, so just leave it to us. So it serves purposes both at the micro level, where it allows them to get more profit, at the regulatory level, where it says, regulators, let us do it, and at the more social political level, when they say, well, we're, it's too complicated, it's too technical, nobody can understand it. And that's one of the things that I try to do in my book is to make these kinds of issues understandable to, to everyday people, students and, and people in the street and people even in the government who want to understand better how these uh, financial products work and oftentimes only work for the banks. The title of my book is Busting the Bankers Club, Finance for the Rest of Us. And um, if you look at it, it from one side, you say, well, finance is so powerful. It's got all this whole huge club behind it. It has all this money at its disposal. So it's hopeless. Um, but what I found is that no, in fact, there's this whole group of what I call club busters out there, uh, economists, lawyers, some government um, people, politicians, uh, and others who are really tr fighting and have been fighting for a long time to reform the financial system and make it work for the rest of us. So for example, starting at the top, the politicians. We have politicians like Elizabeth Warren and Sherrod Brown and Jeff Merkley and many others who um, have really made regulating finance and making it work for the rest of us uh, a top priority. And um, so they, that's crucial. And then we have uh, lawyers uh, and legal scholars like Jennifer Taub and, um, and uh, Saula Omarosa. Um, Omarova, excuse me, who um, was prevented from being the, the head of the OCC because she, they thought she would uh, be too hard on the banks, and many other lo legal scholars um, who are trying to show uh, what's wrong with finance and how we can le regulate it better. Uh, then you have economists and, and educational institutions. INET is one of them. Um, economists uh, like Jane Darista and, and others who um, are trying to puncture holes in this mythology of finance, uh, helping everybody uh, when it's deregulated and being too technical. And then we have uh, activists who operate at a number of different levels. So for example, Dennis Kelleher in Better Markets, or Lisa Donners and um, Americans for Financial Reform. Uh, and um, then at the grassroots, there are many activists out there. Um, uh, many of them are pushing for, for uh, regulations of various kinds. And importantly, they're pushing for publicly oriented financial uh, 
institutions, public banks and other kinds of financial institutions like that, which I think are really crucial for busting uh, the Bankers Club. Banks without bankers means publicly oriented financial institutions. Uh, th they may be wholly owned by the government or by a municipality or by a state. Uh, they might be a public-private partnership that is for whom <coughs> have, a, have a social mission and profit, maximizing profit, isn't the main focus. Um, and they can be uh, a hybrid, par partly public, partly private, which actually most financial institutions are. And they often have uh, particular missions, uh, missions, say, uh, for affordable ho to finance affordable housing, or missions to finance uh, green energy, or uh, to finance a small business, or, um, or, or housing, or something like that. And uh, we have, um, uh, over, over the world, over the whole world, there are many public financial institutions. In the United States, we have a number of different kinds. You can think of, um, of credit unions and others, which I would uh, call public financial institutions. Um, but they're mostly very small, and they're not up to scale to really compete with the big financial institutions. Uh, I think the, having a, a, a richer and, and better, bigger uh, ecology of public financial institutions is crucial uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, they will provide um, the, the things that we need rather than the things that the bankers need. But number two, um, the bankers have a big club that they hold over the heads of the rest of us. So that's the kind of double entendre in the uh, title of my book. The club is, well, if, if you don't give us what we want, we're going to have uh, a capital strike. We're not going to finance you, or we're going to move our headquarters or abroad, or we're going to do something else. If we have a really rich uh, group of public financial institutions, um, it'll be easier for us as a society to say, OK, good riddance, goodbye, you can move, we don't need you. So these public financial institutions also serve as um, a safety net for, for the rest of us. Uh, uh, when, the public when the private financial institutions won't do what we really need. So what we need to make them uh, more viable, to l allow them to grow bigger, to allow them, allow them to be uh, a bigger part of our financial system, is we need the same kind of Federal Reserve and government support for, for these kinds of financial institutions as they give to the mega banks. Um, one of the things that keeps the Bankers Club going is what I call the money spigot. The money spigot is the funds that go into um, paying lobbyists, paying economists, paying lawyers, um, um, and uh, buying legislation. Now, the money spigot comes from the, the profits of the big banks, but it also comes from the huge subsidies that our government gives to the big banks. First of all, the government bails them out when they get into trouble. The great financial crisis, uh, the government, the Federal Reserve, and the Treasury spent uh, over $20 trillion bailing out the big banks. They did it again uh, during the COVID um, pandemic in March tw of 2020. We saw it more recently with Silicon Valley Bank and so forth. Uh, but they give almost no money subsidizing and supporting banks without bankers, these publicly oriented financial institutions. So uh, what we need is, for example, the Federal Reserve to open up the discount window and the uh, liquidity support for these kinds of banks. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve should create a, a, a financial regime that allows um, these kinds of banks to thrive. Uh, the government should, should stop bailing out the, the mega banks and, uh, and help these banks um, become bigger and, and uh, more important in our economy. That's what we need.